Hi, and welcome to the lecture on transport operations. After you complete this chapter and related coursework, you will be able to describe and apply effective preparation for transport, safe emergency vehicle operations, appropriate transport decisions, safe patient transfer techniques, and a responsible approach to patient care during transport. You will be able to identify the nine phases of a call and describe the EMT's role in each. You will also be able to discuss the differences between ground and air medical transport. Furthermore, students will understand the steps that need to be taken to properly clean and disinfect the emergency vehicle and equipment following a call. Regarding the National EMS Education Standard Competencies for Operations, the EMT will have a knowledge of operational roles and responsibilities to ensure patient, public, and personnel safety. Specifically regarding the principles of safely operating a ground ambulance, you will know the risks and responsibilities of emergency response as well as the risks and responsibilities of transport. And regarding air medical transport, you will understand safe air medical operations as well as the criteria for utilizing air medical response. Specific to medicine, you will apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. Regarding infectious diseases, the EMT will have an awareness of how to decontaminate equipment after treating a patient and how to decontaminate the ambulance and equipment after treating a patient. Horse-drawn ambulances were used in major U.S. cities in the late 1700s. United States hospitals started their own ambulance services in the 1860s and ambulance attendants traveled with limited medical supplies. So you have to understand this was a very primitive time in medicine. Today's ambulances are stocked with standard medical supplies and many are equipped with technology that can transmit data directly to the emergency department. Today's emphasis on rapid response places the EMT in greater danger while driving to calls. An ambulance is a vehicle that is used for treating and transporting patients who need emergency medical care to the hospital. The first motor-powered ambulance was introduced in 1906, and for decades afterwards, the hearse was most often used as an ambulance because it was the only vehicle with enough room for a person to actually lie down. You can understand that this might be a little concerning to the patient who is injured or ill that a hearse is the one that transports them. Today's ambulances are designed according to strict government regulations based on national standards that are based on suggestions from the ambulance industry as well as EMS personnel. They have an enlarged patient compartment and that's one of the most significant developments. And first responder vehicles respond initially to a scene with personnel and equipment to treat the sick and injured perhaps until an ambulance can arrive. The modern ambulance contains a driver's compartment, a patient compartment big enough for two EMTs and two patients lying supine, as well as their equipment and supplies, two-way radio communications, and design and construction that ensures maximum safety and comfort. Standards for ambulance licensing or certification are established by each state, and many states use federal specifications like the KKKA 1822F. and that is effective August of 2008. The Star of Life emblem identifies vehicles as ambulances and is often affixed to the sides, rear, and roof. If you looked at the previous table, it talks about the three different types of ambulance vehicles. In the upper left corner on your screen, you see a Type 1 vehicle, which is a truck chassis with a modular box. Picture 2 on your right upper corner of your screen shows a Type 2 or a van type ambulance. And Type 3 on the bottom is a van front end van chassis with a modular box. The phases of an ambulance call. An ambulance call has nine phases and these include preparation, dispatch, en route, arrival at scene, transfer of patient to the ambulance, en route to the receiving facility or transport, at the receiving facility or delivery, en route to the station, and the post run phase. The preparation phase involves making sure equipment and supplies are in their proper places and ready for use. The more complex a piece of equipment is and the harder it is to learn to use, the more likely it is to malfunction during an emergency. New equipment should be placed on an ambulance only after proper instruction on its use and consulting with the ambulance medical director. Equipment and supplies should be durable and standardized as much as possible. Equipment should be stored as well as supplies in the ambulance according to how urgently and how often they are used. You should place items needed for life-threatening conditions within easy reach at the head of the primary stretcher. You should place items for cardiac care, external bleeding control, and monitoring blood pressure at the side of the stretcher. Cabinets and drawer fronts should be transparent or labeled. They should open easily and should also close securely. As an EMT, you have access to a large variety of medical equipment and supplies. These are found on table 36-3. 
basic supplies are common supplies carried on ambulance, such as disposable gloves and sharps containers, airway and ventilation equipment, basic wound care supplies, splinting supplies, childbirth supplies, and AED, patient transfer equipment, and medications. Airway and ventilation equipment may include oral and nasal airways for adults, children, and infants. Two sets of equipment for advanced airway procedures if authorized by your state and your medical director. Two portable artificial ventilation devices that operate independently of an oxygen supply, um, such as pocket masks and bag mask devices. And you should follow local guidelines in identifying specific ventilation equipment that you should carry. One portable and one mounted suctioning unit. It should be large bore, non-keaking suction tubing with a semi-rigid pharyngeal tip and additional semi-rigid tips or tonsil tip suction available, a suction yoke, an unbreakable collection canister, and water for rinsing the tips. Suction tubing must reach the patient's airway regardless of their position, and all parts must be disposable or made of material that is easily cleaned or decontaminated. You should have one portable oxygen supply unit located near a door or in the jump kit, and this should contain at least 500 liters of oxygen. It should be equipped with a yoke, a pressure gauge, a flow meter, oxygen supply tubing, a non-rebreather, and a nasal cannula. It should deliver oxygen at a variable rate of 1 to 15 liters a minute, and you should have at least one extra portable 500 liter cylinder on the ambulance. You should also have one mounted oxygen unit containing 3,000 liters of oxygen. It should be equipped with visible flow meters capable of delivering 1 to 15 liters a minute. It should be accessible at the head of the stretcher, and there should be transparent disposable oxygen masks with and without non-rebreathing bags in sizes for adults, children, and infants. Ambulance services that are on runs that last longer than an hour should consider a disposable single-use humidifier for their patients. CPR equipment. A CPR board provides a firm surface under the patient's torso and establishes an appropriate degree of head tilt. If it's unavailable, you can use a long or a short backboard. You can use a tightly rolled sheet or towel to raise the patient's shoulder three to four inches, but you should not use the roll to hyperextend the neck if you suspect that your patient has a spinal injury. Mechanical devices that deliver chest compressions and ventilations are also available, but they are very expensive. You also will carry basic wound care supplies like trauma shears, sterile sheets and sterile burn sheets, adhesive tape in several widths, self-adhering soft roller bandages, sterile dressings, gauze, abdominal or laparotomy pads, sterile universal trauma dressings, and sterile occlusive non-adherent dressings, adhesive bandages, tourniquets, and adult-sized mast pants or pneumatic anti-shock garments. You will also carry splinting supplies in adult and child sizes, like traction splints, arm and leg splints. They can be inflatable, vacuum, cardboard, plastic, foam wire ladder, or padded board. Triangular and roller bandages, a short backboard device, a long backboard, a head immobilization device, and cervical collars in an adjustable size or a variety of sizes. You should also carry childbirth supplies, including at least one sterile emergency OB kit that has surgical scissors, hemostats or special cord clamps, umbilical tape or sterilized cords, small rubber bulb syringes, towels, gauze sponges, a pair, several pairs of sterile gloves, sanitary napkins, a plastic bag, a baby knit cap, and a baby blanket. Your AED should be semi-automated defibrillation equipment or manual monitor defibrillators, and you should consult your local protocols and your local medical director regarding those equipment. You must also have patient transfer equipment, including a primary wheeled ambulance stretcher, which must allow for 60-degree semi-sitting position and 10 to 15-degree Trendelenburg, which is the feet elevated at 6 to 10 inches, and this is for airway care and treatment of shock. You should have fasteners to secure the stretcher firmly to the floor or side of the ambulance during transport, and at least three restraining devices for your patient. Other devices you may have include a scoop stretcher, a portable folding stretcher, a flexible stretcher, and a basket stretcher. You should also have a wheeled stair chair, a long backboard, and a short backboard or short immobilization device. You will also potentially carry medications, and these need to be appropriate medications per protocol that have not expired. And you should have the telephone number and radio frequency of online medical control or your local poison control center on the ambulance. You will also carry a jump kit, and this should be portable, durable, and waterproof. It should be a five-minute kit, anything that you might need in the first five minutes with the patient with the exception of the AED. It should be easy to open and secure, and the table here on 36-4 lists many items carried in a jump kit. These include your disposable gloves, triangular bandages, trauma shears, adhesive tape, universal trauma dressings, self-adhering soft roller bandages, oral airways, bag mask device, blood pressure cuff and stethoscope, pen light, sterile gauze dressings, sterile dressings, both 4x4, 6x9, or 8x10, adhesive strips, oral glucose, and activated charcoal. 
Your safety and operations equipment should include several kinds of equipment for responder safety, rescue ops, and local emergency scenes. It should include personal safety equipment, um, such as personal protective equipment for exposure to blood or other body fluids, face shields, gowns, shoe covers, and caps, turnout gear, helmets with face shields or safety goggles, safety shoes or boots. There should be no hazmat gear because this is reserved for hazmat technicians and response teams. And you should have equipment for your work areas, and it needs to be located in a waterproof compartment outside of the patient compartment. You should have warning devices that flash or have reflectors, two high-intensity, recharging, battery-powered, stand-up halogen, 20,000 candle power flashlights. You should have a type ABC fire extinguisher, dry powder, five pound minimum, hard hats or helmets with face shields or safety goggles, and portable floodlights. You should have pre-planning and navigation equipment that should be located in the driver's compartment detailed street and area maps, directions to key locations like hospitals, as well as extrication equipment. Your extrication equipment should be located in a weatherproof compartment outside of the patient compartment. This is um, equipment that is needed for simple light extrication, even if extrication and rescue units are readily available. And Table 36.5 here lists the items that should be included in this extrication compartment. Your personnel should include at least one EMT in the patient compartment during transport, and we do recommend two, but one is the minimum requirement. Um, some services may have a non-EMT driver and a single EMT in the patient compartment. However, under state of Montana law, a minimum crew requirement is two EMTs. You should perform daily inspections, and this includes your ambulance inspection that includes fuel, oil, and transmission fluid levels, engine cooling, batteries, brake fluid, engine belts, check the inflation pressure of wheels and tires, including the spare, and look for signs of unusual or uneven wear. You should check all your interior and exterior lights, your windshield wipers and fluid, your horn and siren, your air conditioners, heaters, and ventilating system, and you should make sure that doors open, close, latch, and lock properly. Your communication systems, vehicle, and portable, and you should check for cleanliness and position of all windows and mirrors. Inspect for cleanliness, quantity, and function of medical equipment and supplies, as well as inspect your oxygen supplies, your jump kit, your splints, your dressings and bandages, your backboards and other stabilization equipment, your OB kit, and all of your battery-operated equipment, like your AED. You should also daily review safety precautions, and this includes review of standard traffic safety rules and regulations. Make sure that safety devices like seat belts are in proper working order. Oxygen tanks must be secured by fixed clasps or housings, and you should make sure that all equipment in the cab, rear, and compartments is secured appropriately. Your dispatcher should gather and record the nature of the call, the caller's name and present location, as well as the callback number, the exact location of the patient, which is most important, and the number of patients and severity of their conditions, as well as other pertinent information. This is your dispatch phase. Your in route to the scene phase. In many ways, this is the most dangerous phase for EMTs. We have to realize that collisions cause many serious injuries, and seat belts should be fastened and shoulder harnesses in place before moving the ambulance. You need to review your dispatch information and prepare to assess and care for the patient. You assign specific duties and scene management tasks and decide what equipment you should take in initially. Upon your arrival at the scene, you need to perform a scene size up and give a brief report of your findings to dispatch. You use the following guidelines. Look for safety hazards, evaluate the need for additional units, determine the mechanism of injury or nature of the illness, and evaluate the need for spinal stabilization, as well as following all standard precautions. For mass casualty incidents, you need to estimate and communicate the number of patients to the incident commander, request additional units through dispatch, and remember the incident command system will be established defining each responder's role in the response. Safe parking is important and it involves picking a position that will allow for efficient traffic control and flow around an emergency scene. You should park 100 feet before or past a crash scene to create a barrier between you and traffic. Do not park alongside a scene. You may block movement of other emergency vehicles. Park uphill or upwind of the scene with smoke or hazardous materials and leave your warning lights or devices on. Keep a distance between your vehicle and scene operations. Stay away from fires, explosive hazards, downed wires, and unstable structures. Set your parking brake. Park as close to the scene as possible to facilitate emergency medical care and rapid transport from the scene. And if it is necessary to block traffic to unload equipment or load patients, do so quickly and safely. 
Traffic control is also important and realize that only when all patients have been treated and the emergency situation is under control should you be concerned with restoring the flow of traffic. The purpose of traffic control is to ensure an orderly traffic flow, warn other drivers, and prevent another crash. As soon as possible, you should place warning devices like reflectors on both sides of the crash. The transfer phase is where the patient must be packaged for transport. You need to secure the patient to a backboard scoop stretcher or wheeled ambulance stretcher and properly lift them into the patient compartment. Secure the patient with at least three straps across the body and use deceleration or stopping straps over the patient's shoulders, especially if he or she is lying flat or secured to a backboard. EMTs should safely transport the patient in the shortest time possible. Excessive speed is unnecessary and dangerous, and you should inform dispatch of the following when you are ready to leave with the patient. The number of patients, the name of the receiving hospital, and the beginning mileage of the ambulance, but this is only in some jurisdictions. It's not routinely done here. Monitor the patient's condition en route and recheck a stable patient's vital signs every 15 minutes and an unstable patient's vital signs every 5 minutes. Contact the receiving hospital via radio or phone and never abandon the patient emotionally. In the delivery phase, you will notify dispatch of your arrival at the hospital, report your arrival to the receiving nurse, physically transfer your patient, present a complete verbal report, complete a detailed written report, including the history of current illness or injury, the pertinent positives and negatives, the nature of illness or mechanism of injury, the relevant past medical or surgical history, medications and allergies, as well as pre-hospital treatment and its effect. After transferring the patient, it may be possible to restock items used during the call site, such as oxygen mask dressings and bandages. When you're en route to the station, you should inform dispatch whether you are in service and where you are going. You do the following as soon as you're back at the station. You should clean and disinfect your ambulance and equipment if you didn't do it at the hospital, and here it's routinely done at the hospital. And restock any supplies that you may have used if you didn't restock at the hospital. In the post-run phase, you should complete and file any additional written reports and again inform dispatch of your status, location, and availability and perform routine ambulance inspections as well as refueling. It is important to know the meaning of the following terms. Cleaning is the process of removing dirt, dust, blood, or other visible contaminants from a surface or equipment. Disinfection is the killing of pathogenic agents by directly applying a chemical made for that purpose to a surface or equipment. High-level disinfection is the killing of pathogenic agents by the use of potent means of disinfection, and sterilization is a process such as that used, like heat, that removes all microbial contamination. After each call, perform the following regimen. Strip used linens from the stretcher and place them in a plastic bag or designated receptacle and discard medical waste, like disposable equipment used for patient care during the call, in an appropriate receptacle. Also wash contaminated areas with soap and water. Disinfect all non-disposable equipment used for patient care during the call and clean the stretcher with an EPA-registered germicidal virucidal solution or bleach and water at a 1 in 100 dilution. You should clean spillage or other contamination with the same germicidal or virucidal solution as of bleach water and create a schedule for the routine cleaning of the emergency vehicle. You should refer to the manufacturer's recommendations to create a written policy or procedure for cleaning each piece of equipment. Over 6,000 ambulance crashes over 6,000 ambulance crashes occur in the United States each year, and some of these are fatalities. An ambulance involved in a crash delays patient care at a minimum and, at worst, may take the lives of the EMTs, other motorists, pedestrians, or your patient. Some states require drivers to successfully complete an approved emergency vehicle operations course. Physical fitness and alertness are necessary to properly operate an emergency vehicle, and you should not be driving if you take medications that can cause drowsiness or slow your reaction time, you have been drinking alcohol, or you have been working long shifts or multiple consecutive shifts. Notify your employer if you have worked a shift previously and feel unable to safely operate the emergency vehicle. Emotional maturity and stability are necessary to operate under stress, and never think that you can drive in any manner that pleases you simply because you are running lights and sirens. 
There are some safe driving practices to abide by, and the first rule of safe driving in an emergency vehicle is that speed does not save lives. Good patient care does. All drivers and passengers must wear seat belts and shoulder restraints at all times. If you remove your seat belt to provide care, fasten it again as soon as possible. Unrestrained or improperly restrained patients and equipment may become airborne during a collision. You need to become familiar with how your emergency vehicle accelerates corners, sways, and stops under various conditions. Make sure you understand the vehicle braking characteristics and the best downshifting techniques. In a multi-lane highway, stay in the extreme left hand or fast lane, allowing other motorists to move over to the right lane when they see or hear you approach. Table 36.6 has some guidelines for safe ambulance driving, and you should be familiar with these. There is a risk-benefit analysis of the utilization of sirens. The decision to activate emergency lighting and sirens will depend on several factors, such as your local protocols, your patient's condition, and the anticipated clinical outcome of your patient. Drivers should always anticipate. You should always assume that motorists around your vehicle have not heard your siren or PA system or seen you until proven otherwise by their actions. If a motorist does yield the right of way to the emergency vehicle, the operator should attempt to establish eye contact with the other driver. Look at the direction of the other vehicle's front tires to get an early indication of which way it will turn. And remember, you must always drive defensively. The cushion of safety is an important factor in safe ambulance operations. Maintaining a safe following distance from the vehicles in front of you and trying to avoid being tailgated from behind is important. Ensure that the blind spots in your vehicle's mirrors do not prevent you from seeing vehicles or pedestrians on either side of the ambulance. To distance yourself from a tailgater, slow down or contact the local police. Never get out of the ambulance to confront a driver because this delays emergency response or patient transport. And remember, a verbal altercation with a member of the public may lead to disciplinary action or termination. There are three blind spots around the ambulance. And remember, mirrors create a blind spot in front of the driver. The rear of the vehicle cannot be seen fully through the mirror the side of the vehicle. You should scan your mirrors frequently for any new hazards and use a spotter and predetermined hand signals when backing up an ambulance. The problem of excessive speed. Excessive speed is unnecessary, dangerous, and does not increase the patient's chances of survival. It makes it difficult for EMTs to provide care in the patient compartment and it hinders the driver's reaction time. It increases time and distance needed to stop the ambulance as well. Recognition of siren syndrome. Siren syndrome causes drivers to drive faster in the presence of sirens due to increased anxiety. Although a siren signifies a request for drivers to yield the right of way, drivers do not always do, so, do that. You also need to be aware of vehicle size and distance judgment. Crashes will often occur when a vehicle is backing up, so you should use a spotter. Always realize that that ground guide is important. Remember, size and weight greatly influence braking and stopping distances. Road positioning and cornering. Road position means the position of the vehicle on the roadway relative to the inside or outside edge of the paved surface. To keep the ambulance in the proper lane when turning a corner, enter high in the lane to the outside and exit low to the inside. Weather and road conditions. Ambulances have a longer braking time and stopping distance. In addition, the weight of the ambulance is unevenly distributed, which makes it more prone to rollovers. You should be alert to changing weather, road, and driving conditions. Hydroplaning can occur and cause issues. At speeds of greater than 30 miles an hour, a tire may be lifted off the road as water piles up under it, and the vehicle may feel as if it's floating. If this occurs, you should gradually slow down without jamming on the brakes. Water on the roadway. Wet brakes will not slow the vehicle as efficiently as dry brakes, and the vehicle may pull to one side or the other. You need to avoid driving through large pools of standing water, and driving through moving water should be avoided at all times. Decreased visibility. In areas where there is fog, smog, snow, or heavy rain, slow down after warning cars behind you. You should always use headlights during the day and watch carefully for stopped or slow moving vehicles. Ice and slippery surfaces. Good all-weather tires at an appropriate speed will reduce traction problems significantly and consider using studded snow tires or tire chains if they are permitted by law. Although emergency vehicle drivers are exempt from normal vehicle operations during a call, certain laws and regulations must be followed. Motor vehicle crashes are the single largest source of lawsuits against EMS personnel and services, and if you are on an emergency call and are using your warning lights and siren, you may be allowed to do the following. Park or stand in an otherwise illegal location. Proceed through a red traffic light or stop sign, but never without stopping first. Drive faster than the posted speed limit and drive against the flow of traffic on a one-way street or make a turn that is normally illegal. 
travel left of the center to make an otherwise illegal pass. An emergency vehicle is never allowed to pass a school bus that has stopped to load or unload children and is displaying its flashing red lights or extended stop arm. Use of warning lights and sirens is governed by three basic principles. The unit must be on a true emergency call to the best of your knowledge. Both audible and visual warning devices must be used simultaneously and it must be operated with due regard for the safety of all others. State motor vehicle statutes or codes often grant an emergency vehicle the right to disregard the rules of the road when responding to an emergency. In doing so, the operator of an emergency vehicle must not endanger people or property under any circumstances. You need to know your local right-of-way privileges and exercise them only when it is absolutely necessary for the well-being of your patient. You should only use police escorts as a guide when you are in unfamiliar territory and never and remember, neither vehicle should be using warning lights or sirens. If you are being guided, make sure that you follow at a safe distance. Intersection crashes are the most common and usually the most serious type of collision in which ambulances are involved, and you should always be alert and careful when approaching intersections. If you are on an urgent call and cannot wait for traffic lights to change, you should still come to a momentary stop at the light. You should shut down emergency lights and sirens until you have reached the far left lane and highways. For unpaved road waves, you need to take special care and operate the vehicle at a lower speed and maintain a firm grip on the steering wheel. In school zones, it is unlawful for an emergency vehicle to exceed the speed limit in school zones regardless of the condition of the patient. While the ambulance is in motion, focus on driving and anticipating roadway hazards, and you need to minimize distractions from mobile dispatch terminals and GPS, mounted mobile radios, stereos, cell phones, and eating and drinking. When you're driving alone, it is your responsibility to focus on figuring out the safest route while mentally preparing for the call. Situations such as these demand your complete attention and focus. You should recognize when you are fatigued and alert your partner or supervisor. If you are feeling fatigued, you should be placed out of service for the remainder of the shift or until the fatigue has passed and you feel capable of operating the vehicle safely. Air ambulances are used to evacuate medical and trauma patients. Fixed wing units are used for inter-hospital patient transfers over, different, over distances greater than 100 to 150 miles. Rotor wing units or helicopters are more efficient for short distances. Specially trained crews accompany air ambulance flight and the EMT's duties are limited to providing ground support. Helicopter medical evacuation operations. Remember, medevac is performed exclusively by helicopters and medevac capabilities, protocols, and procedures vary between services. So why should you call for a medevac? Some of the things to consider are the transport time to the hospital by ground is too long considering the patient's condition. Road, traffic, or environmental conditions prohibit the use of a ground ambulance. The patient requires advanced care beyond your capabilities such as pain med administration or airway insertion. Or there are multiple patients which will overwhelm resources at the hospital reachable by ground transport. Who can receive medevac? Patients with time-dependent injuries or illnesses, patients suspected of having a stroke, heart attack, or serious spinal cord injury, patients who have experienced scuba diving accidents near drownings or skiing in wilderness accidents, trauma patients, and candidates for limb replantation um, or in need of a burn center, a hyperbaric chamber, or a venomous bite center. So who do you call? Generally, you notify dispatch. In some regions, EMS may be able to communicate with a flight crew after initiating the request. Establishing a landing zone. The safest and most effective way to land and take off is similar to that used for fixed wing. You land at a slight angle and that allows for safer operations and establishment of the LZ is the responsibility of the ground EMS crew or the fire department. An appropriate site for landing zone should be a hard or grassy level surface between 60 feet by 60 feet and 100 feet by 100 feet and the recommendation is 100 by 100. It should be cleared of loose debris like branches, trash bins, flares, accident tape, medical equipment and supplies, and you need to alert the flight crew to the presence of overhead or, ta or tall hazards like power lines, telephone cables, antennas, or trees. Mark the landing site using weighted cones or emergency vehicles positioned at the corners of the landing zone with headlights facing inward to form an X. Move all non-essential personnel and vehicles to a safe distance outside the landing zone and communicate the direction of strong winds to the flight crew. A bed sheet, technically secured to a tree or pole, can be used to help the crew determine wind direction and strength, but never use tape. Landing zone safety and patient transfer. You should stay away from the helicopter and go only where the pilot or crew member directs you to. The most important rule is to keep a safe distance from the aircraft whenever it is on the ground and hot, which means with the helicopter blades spinning. If you are asked to enter at the LZ, stay away from the tail rotor. The tips of its blade move so rapidly they are invisible. 
and never approach the helicopter from the rear even if it is not running. When you approach, walk in a crouch position and approach from the front. And you can see here, approach from the front and crouched. Remember, rotor blades can dip to as low as four feet off the ground, which is why you should be crouched, and the tail rotor blades are invisible, so stay away. Keep the following guidelines in mind when operating a landing, an LZ. Become familiar with your jurisdiction's helicopter hand signals. Do not approach unless instructed and accompanied by the flight crew. Make certain that all patient care equipment and the patient are properly secured to the stretcher. Remember, some helicopters may load patients from the side while others have rear loading doors. Smoking, open lights or flames, and flares are prohibited within 50 feet of the aircraft at all times. In your medevac request, to prevent communications issues, include a ground contact radio channel and call sign of the unit the medevac should make contact with. This slide gives you some standard air medical hand signals to be aware of. Some special considerations. For night landings, do not shine spotlights, flashlights, or any other lights in the air to help the pilot. They may temporarily blind him or her. Direct low-intensity headlights or lanterns toward the ground at the landing site and illuminate overhead hazards or obstructions if possible. If you're landing the helicopter on uneven ground, it is if it is necessary, you need to use extra caution. The main rotor blade will be closer to the ground on the uphill side, and so you should approach the out aircraft from the downhill side only at, or as directed by the flight crew. Medevacs and hazmat. You need to notify the flight crew if the scene is a hazmat incident and consult them and the incident commander about the best approach and distance from the scene for the medevac. The landing zone should be uphill and upwind from the hazmat scene and properly decontaminate patients before you load them into the helicopter. There are several important factors that must be taken into consideration when making the decision to request a medevac. Assess the severity of the weather or environment and terrain. And remember, most helicopter services are limited to flying at 10,000 feet above sea level. Medevac helicopters fly between 130 and 150 miles an hour. Because of the cabin's confined space, assess the number and size of the patients that can be safely transported in a medevac helicopter. Typical medevac flights cost between eight and $10,000, whereas ambulance transport costs between 400 to 1,000. In summary, today's ambulances are designed according to strict governmental regulations based on national standards. The ambulance call has nine phases, and these include call preparation, dispatch, en route, arrival at scene, transfer of the patient to the ambulance, en route to the receiving facility or transport, at the receiving facility or delivery, and en route to the station and post run. Certain items, like sterile gloves, must be available on the ambulance at all times, as dictated by state and jurisdictional requirements. Every ambulance must be staffed with at least one EMT in the patient compartment whenever a patient is being transported. Two EMTs are strongly recommended, however, there are some services that may use a non-EMT driver and a single EMT in the patient compartment. Check all medical equipment and supplies at least daily, including all the oxygen supplies, the jump kits, splints, dressings and bandages, backboards and other stabilization equipment, and the emergency OB kit. During the post-run phase, you should complete and file any additional written reports and inform dispatch of your status, location, and availability. Perform a routine inspection to ensure that the ambulance is ready to respond to the next call. Learn how to properly operate your emergency vehicle. Speed does not save lives, good care does. The driver and all passengers must wear seat belts and shoulder restraints at all times. Air ambulances are used to evacuate medical and trauma patients. Both fixed wing and rotor wing aircraft or helicopters are used. A medical evacuation is commonly known as a medevac and is generally performed by helicopters. As always, if you have questions, please bring them to your instructor to discuss in the face-to-face -face portion of your class. Thank you.